Well, I knew something was going on when mum and dad and friends were talking about this German Hitler and war was mentioned. We just thought it would be all finished in a matter of a few months and, and it didn't happen. But somehow we would, we would not or could not believe that it would reach our shores. A messenger came with a megaphone at the top of the beach and shouted, you must all go home. The Germans are coming. There's going to be a mass evacuation. Be at the parish schools at seven o'clock tonight and you will have further instruction. Mum woke me up very early one morning and she said, now come along. She said, we're going to England. We've got to get away from the island because the Germans are supposed to be coming. Shock chaos, confusion, sums it all up. Indecision was, was awful. On one wall, it would be written, go now while you have a chance. On another, the enemy is coming, leave while you can. And on another wall, stay put, don't be yellow. So my sister and I went home and the boat came during the night, took everybody away, and that was the last boat, so we didn't get another chance, and I'm very, very glad that happened. About half the population left the island. The schools uh, evacuated en bloc, more or less, but there were just over a thousand school children left when the Germans arrived. And in the end, oh, I suppose it must be late afternoon, they said, the ship is full, come back tomorrow morning at the same time. Well, my mum was furious because we'd expected to go and Dad would follow probably the next day or the day after. Anyway, we got back home and when she got inside, Dad said, well, you know, you haven't gone. She said, no. And she said, we're not leaving. So he said, why? She said, well, I'm going to trust in the good Lord. And she said, we're going to stay. We're not going to be parted at all. So that's what we did. We stayed. You must remember that that anybody who decided to go, it meant leaving home, leaving possessions, property, your business, and going with virtually nothing to England. My father would have gone on one boat, my mother and my baby sister on another, and my other sister and I on, on, the, on another one, and she said, well, it could be months before we'll ever meet up again. And on the other hand, if you decided to stay, you took a chance that the enemy would land on our shores. Oh, it, it was really a terrible, confusing time. And then we had second thoughts, and we believed it was getting a bit dangerous to stay in the island. And I think if the Germans hadn't been quick to land on the Sunday, by the Monday we'd have been off. My sister had gone up to the shop at the corner to get sweets for the evening for us to settle down and read books and things. And she was coming back, I was watching her, I was sitting in the bay window watching her coming down the road. And I heard this plane. And we saw these Heinkel aircraft flying from the south to the north. We were waving, I was waving this cucumber, I know we'd just bought it, and I was waving to these planes because we thought they were British. And with that, there was machine gun. 
and then immediately another bang, bang. We all went into a cupboard under the stairs. I don't quite know what that would have done, but perhaps he thought it would have given a bit of protection. And we stayed there for quite a long time. And there was a noise, I suppose I can best describe it as a child running along pulling a stick along walls. There was this most ghastly screaming noise. I'd never heard anything like it. Pop, 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 pop. I realised there were sparks and things coming out of the wall right the other side of the road from where she was, and she was running like an Olympic runner. She was going like the crackers. And my father ran out and picked her up and said, I'm brought her in. That was the beginning of this terrible air raid. And of course, all the tomato lorries were there, all burning, because they'd all been hit. And it was terrible. There, you know, I saw two uh, bodies, or parts of bodies, that had been uh, mutilated. And about half an hour after the air raid stopped, my father and brother and I went down to the harbour and saw the carnage there. And you know, this is a small island, and horticulture was its main industry. I would say that nearly everybody in Guernsey knew someone who was likely to be on the White Rock at that time. Oh, that was a sad day. If you've ever heard a bomb falling on the television, this is something quite different. You think the end of the world has come. Well, actually it had, our world. It was the Sunday afternoon after the Friday air raid. We saw a huge aircraft carrier pass low over the island. The Iron Cross was plain to see, and we were uneasy. The island's only police car at that time swung out of Queen's Road and passed me and I noticed, standing on the running board of the vehicle, was a German soldier with a submachine gun across his chest. And it was decided we'd all sleep in one bed that night because they were frightened that if the Germans knocked on the door, they would steal one of us. So my parents felt happier if we all got together in one bed. But nobody came. We didn't see the Germans for quite a few days. We just were frightened, really, actually, of seeing them. But uh, we soon found they were walking through our streets. I was at the top of High Street, and I saw this German coming down. And quite frankly, um, it surprised me because in the newspapers, <clears throat> They were talking about all the Germans being square-headed and f ruthless, as it were, and I didn't know whether I had to run or what, but he seemed quite human, actually, and I was rather surprised. Well, first of all, we were a little bit frightened because we didn't really know what to expect, but it wasn't long before we were sort of marching along the roads behind them like children do. My, one of our little mates, he said, there's a, there's a German officer watching us because we were swinging on the trees, you know, and all that sort of thing. And so, sure enough, it was. And he was the real German that was always depicted in films. You couldn't see his hair because there was hardly any hair there. I don't think it was all sort of shaved. Underneath his very nice, decorated peak cap. And he had magenta stripes down his britches. And he was a very, obviously, a very well-cultured man. He was the doctor. He spoke perfect English. Dad came in, he said, there's some Germans walking down the Par Hill, the Cobo Hill, coming down towards Cobo Mission. So he said, now come along. He said, you want to see a German, don't you? So I said, yes, I'd like to see what they look like. So we went out, the family, and just stood outside our gate. And they came along and they stopped. And one of them, in bro very broken English, asked Dad if he could have a jug of water because they were thirsty. Anyway, they had their water, very polite, thanked us, and off they went. And I said, Dad, what were you doing with your sleeve? You seem to be playing with something. And he said, yes. He said, I'll put a carving knife up my sleeve. I said, whatever for? Well, he said, of course, we'd heard that they might do something dreadful. And he said, I just wanted to be prepared. And the inspectors came round to check the houses, and ours was one that was selected. And the officer that came into our house, his name was Horst. And he wasn't a very pleasant man. 
Into the front drive of our house came this bus load of German soldiers, first I'd ever seen. And two officers got out and came to the door and they wanted to look over the hotel. And they did. And they said, right, you can have that room for you and your husband. They told my mother. You can have that room for your two girls and you can have the use of the kitchen. And you can also have the use of the lounge if we're not using it. And they just unloaded the bus into the hotel. A couple of days after they'd arrived, we went down to Kobo Post Office. And there were uh, quite a few German soldiers in there. And they were buying up all the sweets, all the sugar, all the tin fruit. And, you know, as a little girl, I used to think, well, there'll be none left. Initially, they were extremely uh, correct. Uh, they did everything by the book. We were equally doing the same. They'd walk up the street, we'd walk down the other side and try not to get involved with them in any way. To me and, and my group of friends, it was the freedom of speech and the curfew. You had to be in at nine o'clock. Well, my father would have made me be in at nine o'clock anyway, I suppose. I think the lowest point was seeing the barbed wire go up on the walls and then we really felt we were prisoners. I think that was my lowest point when I saw that. There were orders, German orders, on the newspapers every day. Different rules and regulations. Oh yes, everything. Our lives changed, absolutely. We all rode and cycled and drove our cars on the left of the road. And of course they were all driving on the right and there was unteen collisions where people were going the wrong way. So the first thing I remember is them changing that. We had to drive on the right hand side of the, of the road. All our windows had to be blacked out, not a chink of light. And they were very strict about cyclists. Not, you didn't have to cycle two or three abreast. And cycling home we were, dark was coming and we were stopped in Queen's Road by the German patrol and uh, my girlfriend then didn't have a cycle lamp. I had a dynamo but she had no light. So they stopped us, whipped the valves out of her tyre, told us to go on home and report back the next morning. Being again rather naughty children we all decided to ride two abreast or three abreast or something. And they came out and reprimanded us and took all the valves out of our bicycles. So we had to, we were then told we had to go back the next day and collect them, so we had to walk home. <laughs> it was silly, really. But I've been fined a couple of times for riding two abreast on the way to school. We were supposed to learn German and I had a cousin and the two of us decided that we weren't going to learn German and our poor headmaster was hauled before the authorities and told that we were very naughty children but we never did learn German, we just wouldn't and I think perhaps the German teacher was quite pleased to get rid of us. But no, I was pretty fluent in it, and so were the kiddies at school, because we had to learn it. And yes, I, I still speak quite a lot of German. After all these years, I still remember the German language. Ich habe vergessen um, viel Deutsch, aber ich kann die Sprache ein bisschen. Ich weiß nicht, was ich sage, schau. Um, vielleicht kann ich ein bisschen sagen. But on one occasion, I know a German came in, and he looked at me, and he says, was ist das? and he was pointing at a picture, and I said, das ist das Bild. Good, good. Then he'd go around the class, and I believe he came once or twice, maybe a little more after that. I had a German soldier who did all my homework, most of it. And of course, they were going to win the war, weren't they? And of course, all these lovely children were going to be Hitler Youth, you see, and we had to, you know, we were starting to become Germans, I suppose. He came in one day, and I was doing my algebra, I think, Oh, he could do that. And in the end, he used to do my algebra, my French, my German, my arithmetic, and what's geometry. He did those five subjects for me. The ordinary German soldiers 
I don't think any different than the English or other soldiers we were around. Because we never sort of went out deliberately to make friends with them. I suppose we were a little bit sort of apprehensive, really. To me, they were, they were just soldiers and, and not enemies because I was too young to know what an enemy really was. They came to our house because it was just a short little walk from the top of the field down to our house. And the first one was Philip Stroll. And he made himself known, immediately said that he would like to be with his family at home. He hated war. And that's how we got to know him and became quite friendly with him. They didn't really, a lot of them didn't want to be in the army, to be quite honest. You know. Most of them had left their families behind at home, their wives and children. My brother, as I said, worked in the gentleman's outfitters in, in the arcade. And one went in one day and asked him the way to Piccadilly. And he said, you're a long way from Piccadilly, mate. He said, no, I'm in London. This is London. And I think some of them thought they'd really occupied England. And um, my brother said, well, this is Guernsey, a little island, and you'll never find Piccadilly. You were, you were, you know, mixing and passing each other on the stairs, passing each other in the hall. And uh, when you think there were about 20,000 over here, and the common expression was the island was crawling with German soldiers, which it was. And of course, my sister and I were only children, and to us, they were just people in uniform. But there were one or two that were, you know, they were Nazis, and uh, you know, you just ignored those. They were evil. It was almost like a nightmare. And it was their voices and the smell of their uniforms, these glass cloth things Mother said they were made of, that haunted me for many, many years after the occupation ended, many, many years. because everybody thought it was going to be over in six months or a year. And of course, it dragged on and on. One other thing my dad used to do, he had a little cart that he attached to the back of his bicycle. And wherever he went, he had this little thing. And he'd pass a road. If you see a piece of wood in the hedge, he'd fight for this bit of wood and put it in his thing. I mean, we'd all have to go out in the garden and saw it up. And, um, and this is how we kept going, really. And my younger sister and I were detailed to get rabbit food every night. We also were detailed to turn cow pats. Turn them one day, fetch them the next, and stack them for the winter. That was summer. And we used to moan like mad about that. We used to go looking, as I've said before, for wood and you know, bramble tea we used to make, so we'd go for getting brambles, uh, bramble leaves and um, acorns. We used to do a lot of sort of fetching and doing. I didn't like the acorn coffee at all, it was horrible. When the food gets short, it is ordinary animal instinct that you want to eat, isn't it? And I would search the cupboards to see if there was anything there, knowing full well, of course, if there had been, Mother would have given it to me. We were growing in our greenhouses, my, my parents, uh, for the GUB, the Guernsey Utilisation Board, and we were able to keep a little bit of the crops, but not very much. We were living on potato peels, because the potatoes went to the board, but some of the peels we were able to use. Our garden was festooned with tins, and so that if anybody walked in the garden to steal them, we would hear them. But they still came in and stole the rabbits, even with all the tins, so there must have been somebody who knew they were there. My father and mother spent every penny they could or earned in the war on black market to it. And my father was growing potatoes in the greenhouses and at night he could go and when the crops were almost ready for harvesting he could go and poke around in the beds of the potatoes and poke out a few potatoes and they put the soil back and uh, we survived like that. You had cabbage, 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 and then root vegetables came in, and uh, parsnips were lovely to start with. After th so many weeks, then they started to get shriveled, and oh, you couldn't stand them, and your stomach couldn't take them anyway. And, and of course you went to bed hungry, so you couldn't sleep 
so well, and you were cold, you went wrapped in your eider down, you know. Well, we survived somehow. There was this wonderful system of bartering where in the local press people advertised things for barter. So I needed, desperately needed a pair of shoes and my dad had some dried beans. So he advertised that he, um, you know, exchanged so many pounds of beans for a pair of shoes. Shoes were the worst part because of course leather wears out and rubber of course was non-existent eventually. Because your feet grow perhaps more than the rest of your body and shoes become very uncomfortable. Towards the end when, you know, our shoes had worn out, they imported a lot of shoes from France with great thick wooden soles. I don't think my feet have been the same since. And so you had uh, metal on your shoes and I, you had horseshoes, we called them, on, on, our, on the heels and then tips on the, on the soles. So what Dad used to do, he used to get tyres from the cars and it was an awful job, bless him, but he'd take the shape of my foot and then he'd cut the tyre out with a huge knife. And of course if you wanted to play, which we did. That was absolutely super because you could make a noise just like the Germans in their boots. And one of my friends had a very beautiful niece who was dying of TB. And I must say, it, I cringe a bit even today when I think I said to her, when she dies, could I buy a pair of her shoes? But I can remember mum sort of letting out dresses or skirts. And if that didn't do, she'd perhaps get some of the older clothes and, you know, sort of um, add that to the dress to make it longer or wider or whatever. She brought me a pair of red shiny sandals. I'm sorry. And they were so beautiful. One of my aunties um, decided that she had a dress that she could manage without and so she cut it up smaller to make me a dress and it was in brown material and it had some little gold buttons and I thought it was very clever of her to make me this dress. I'd run out of a, a winter coat and I don't know whether she asked a German or whether he gave her one of their blankets and they were grey blankets and she made me a coat out of that and it was really lovely and warm. But there were bright spots and one of them was the concerts that were held at Candy Auditorium. Um, and that was so lovely to go up there on a summer's evening because it wasn't closed in. It was, it was open with just tarpaulins in case it rained or the wind came up and that, and that was just lovely. We used to beg, borrow and even steal anything that we thought was going to be useful for costumes. Um, old curtains, old tablecloths, anything that was slightly pretty out of the ordinary, we we just cut it up and make it into costumes. My sister and I joined a company called the Lyric Number no. One Company. The Lyric was a, a, a picture house in New Street and that turned into a, a variety show house during the occupation. And we used to put on uh, one show a month of ten performances. And um, two I particularly remember dancing up there was Molly B.A. and her younger sister Joyce. She was um, Molly and Joyce Ferguson then and they do this tap dance routine. My sister and I used to dance, and uh, but there were so many. I think we remember the comedians more than anything because they used to make us laugh, and that's what we needed. And um, there was verses made up, you know, which the Germans never picked up really, but it was all to do with the Germans. And uh, a Christmas show was put on um, where she sang "Walking in the Winter Wonderland." My sister and I used to listen in in our bedrooms underneath the covers and she was, um, she went to the Royal Academy of Music after the war so she was a, a, a professional pianist and she used to take down the music and I would take down the words and then we'd sing these at the lyric. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money, maybe we're ragged and funny, we'll travel along singing a song side by side. Oh dear. <laughs> and of course, um, anybody who had a radio knew, gosh, that song only came out this week, uh, they must have a radio. And we used to get a marvellous ovation. I think the Germans used to think, well, wasn't that good? Why do they clap so much? You know, dancing. <laughs> Really, you know, it took your days, you did your work in the shop and then you, at six o'clock you'd have to go out because you had to be home by nine and we'd go dancing or walking or we'd had plays and concerts and you entertained your friends in your home as the best you could. 
and we had lovely trios of bands, you know, to play. We'd have a room perhaps in Sunnycroft in the Grange which would take 50 or 60 people and a uh, little three-piece band and uh, the curfew would depend at either 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock so you'd start at 7 and have to be home by 10. The beauty of that was that no Germans were ever allowed to go dancing and to quite, quite honestly I've been, I suppose I averaged at least two dances a week and um, I never saw a German try to get into a dancer. They really behaved themselves in that way because I think if they'd done something wrong they might have gone to the Russian front or they didn't want to go there. I think the, mo the most frightening time was we heard Germans coming up the path with their big boots and we knew they were coming to search. And what was happening in France and through uh, Poland and other parts where the Germans had occupied was coming through the radios. We were more worried when uh, we were told anybody born outside the island would have to report and leave for the continent. And my, my brother and I were born in Belfast, although of a Guernsey father. So we packed our bag and mum said farewell to us and we walked up the road and uh, clocked in. But there were frightening other times and the particular time was with my mother walking home from a whist drive. We used to go to these little drives and the, these Germans had a few few drinks, staggered up towards my mother with a gun and stuck it in her chest and they were laughing and giggling and that and we were terrified. I mean that caused my mother and I and you know my sister that we didn't go out very much in the evenings apart from being escorted when we did dancing. And then when we were presented our identity cards the German major or sergeant major in charge of screening went a bit apoplectic and yelled at me and said, Irsch, Irsch, Roust! And out we went. He didn't realise Northern Ireland was British. And of course people were picking up the news a lot and yes you did hear a lot of what was going on supposedly in these camps which at the end of the war people found out that everything they were hearing was true. You know the people had a very very rough time compared to what we had in the Channel Islands, I think so, yeah. The Germans that were down in the quarry, they had pieces of hose pipe filled with siftings and they used to bash the slaves with them. They had a number of foreign labourers and they were under the command of the organisation Toad. They built these bunkers, they built the sea wall, they built underground hospital. They changed the scene of your life of Guernsey quite considerably. One day, Sunday morning, going to church, my brother and I reached the top of Brock Road and there was this long line of shackled prisoners. They were absolutely living corpses. So we got talking to them and they said that they were working for the Germans in their own country and they were told that they were getting this lorry because they were going to work in another place. Instead of that, they were taken to the port, brought to Guernsey, in the clothes that they were wearing, and uh, no way of telling their people where they'd gone or what had happened to them. Some of them, I believe, were even doctors, you know, and some of them were uh, uh, conscientious objectors. I remember one, a Pole, it, it, for instance, and uh, he was desperate for food. I, I gave him potatoes because I had plenty of those. We broke the rules as often as we could. 
Bert worked at the dairy when there was no, he was a painter and decorator and there was no more paint or paper. And um, the Germans made us have skim milk, but they had full cream milk. And the children up to the age of 14 had full cream milk. So what Bert and his friends used to do, put low gallons of full cream milk in our skim milk and stand with the hose behind them, filling the Germans' tank full cream milk with water. They would try and cut the German telephone wires or paint over the V signs. The Germans had signs on the walls in the roads. And I thought that was rather foolish because if they couldn't uh, find out who the culprits were, they would pick out innocent people and send them to France. I know of people who were punished by being sent abroad. And if people were of UK origin, they were sent abroad. And a particular friend of ours who did a lot of sabotage, he was sent to Germany. Or they'd reduce the light and or, you know, that sort of thing. It wasn't worth it. It really wasn't. But there wasn't much you could do. And the main reason was that it wasn't so much the punishment you would get, but the punishment that you, they would give to your family. You know, you were frightened your family were going to be deported or shot for something you did. At first we had uh, ordinary radios with, with ordinary um, batteries. In 1941, I think, we lost them for eight weeks. They were confiscated. And then we got them back later, and about two years later, they were finally taken in. First off, a lot of people did hide their wireless in those days. And I remember one day in particular, we were sitting in the kitchen, some Germans walked in, and my mother was there, and we could hear Big Ben downstairs, and my mother was stamping her feet on the floor and chatting at the top of her voice, making as much noise as she could. But they never found it, they never found the radio. Um, a lot of us had, by then, got used to crystal sets where you had little wire and headphones and it's surprising how, how they worked. When we were listening to our crystal sets, we used to have dictation speed at nine o'clock in the morning. And because my mother didn't want to handle this crystal set, I would listen to it and repeat the news to her. She would write it down and we'd hide this paper underneath the runner on our piano you had to be a little bit careful what you spoke or said. I mean, we children were fine, but I think you one had to feel that you trusted people if you were saying the news and that kind of thing. There were some really dirty sneaks that you didn't dare let anybody know that wasn't your friend in case they would report you and then you'd be deported. I think that was, for us, that was the worst time. I think they did it for reward. They hoped to get some sort of reward, but they, they didn't. The Germans took them for what they were. You know, they thought, how dare they tell stories about their fellow men, and they, they just didn't like the collaborators any more than we did. People of the underground newspaper, like Mr. Mashall and Frank Fowler, they were sent to the continent for imprisonment. They got caught in the end, and that was hinting that the D-Day was going to be there. He wasn't quite sure, but they, th they had mentioned that it would be on the Normandy coast. Well, we thought, we thought the, well, the war's nearly over, nobody's going to bother now about a radio, so we all went to the house where the radio was to listen to the, to the landings. And when it started in France, then you could hear it over here. But in the distance, it just didn't come near enough to us. We did wonder, when the Allies landed in France, if we might be released. And then, of course, we thought the war was going to be over, and it wasn't, so he had to hide his radio again. So we, th we thought that was the end for us. We thought we were going to be free and able to go and come as we pleased. But with hindsight, I can see how that would have been quite impossible. There was a war to be run. And we weren't to know then that we had another whole year. It 
was a gradual thing really. It didn't just hit us from one week to the next. The last winter, that when food was very short, it was very difficult. Things were getting pretty grim in that last year. Some of my friends had missed out their breakfast because some families were quite large and only some of them could have breakfast and they alternated breakfast on different days. And uh, th th it got really, really tight. Yes, because really I can remember now being so hungry and my mum, when I came home from school, one day, as I walked into the kitchen, she was shelling peas and she'd just fainted. And I thought she died. The last thing I remember was um, a bit of a half a swede. That was going to be my lunch. But one bit of it was rotten already and you could smell it. And I couldn't eat the rest. It came to a point, of course, when there was, well, hardly any flour. And it came to a point when there was no flour. And I do remember when we had three weeks when there wasn't any bread. Well, I mean, that was a disaster because we had so little else that um, I really don't know what we lived on for three weeks. And I remember, I mean, I imagine now that my parents probably weren't hungry. <laughs> I think if it happened overnight, you would have died of starvation but it comes on you gradually. When we had elderly people with malnutrition, they were just skin and bone when they came into the hospital. Even my grandmother, well, just two years before the, two months before the war ended, she died because she wasn't receiving enough nourishment. We would clean out their mouths. I mean, there's no point in giving them a drink or anything to eat, they'd gone past that. And we would have um, a probe with cotton wool on the end and in liquid and put in their mouths just gently, gently rinse out their mouths, round their teeth and so on. And sometimes they were so far gone that if you pressed a little too hard on the inside of the cheek, the probe simply came straight through the, the flesh. And of course, by that time, the Germans were getting hungry. We used to see them go down on the beaches to collect limpets and winkles. In the summer, they were out blackberrying and all in platoons, you know, made to do it. I had a lovely little dog called Sally. One particular morning we opened up the shed because we put her to sleep in the shed, locked the door because the animals at that time were being taken away and eaten. And uh, I opened up the shed door and, well, I didn't have to open it actually. I went with the key and, you know, nothing was happening. So I tried the door and it was open and no Sally was there. They had a dog, but they lost it one day. And this was near the end of the war. And we know damn well who had it. It was the rough Germans from the quarry that had snaffled the dog, and they ate it, of course. I came back home and I was devastated. Anyway, the following morning, this German came down, Hans, with a piece of meat. And I looked at him and I said, what is that? So he said, meat for you, for your mother, for your family. I said, that's not meat. I said, that's my dog, Sally. And he looked at me and he was indignant. And he said, do thanks mit dein Arsch, nicht mit dein Kopf which means you think with your ass, not with your head. But at the end of the occupation, there was no cats or dogs left on the island. Because we were at our very lowest ebb. There had been no food from France since D-Day. And um, the vegetables were scarce. There was hardly any food at all. That was the worst time, the winter of 1944. Um, and then our parcels came, and of course, that was wonderful. And everybody in Guernsey who was here in the war will remember the Vega. Hmm. Yeah. And um, the parcels were a saviour. We went up to Hopeville, where an aunt of mine lived, and Grandma, and we could see the, vig the Vega from her front the lap from the lounge window. And that was a day, that was. That was, oh, oh the, the Red Cross parcels, well, that was like a miracle. Absolutely wonderful. That was wonderful, that, that was absolutely unbelievable. It was absolutely wonderful. I should think it saved lots of people's lives, but they were wonderful things we hadn't seen for 
few years. When news came through that the Red Cross parcels were coming and dis were distributed, we were four in our family, as I said previously, and we had one each, and it was absolutely fantastic. So this was the Red Cross parcel, a Canadian one anyway, and um, of course it contained a myriad of things and also you had either tea or coffee in one box or the other and um, the if you were a family of four you got two of one and two of the other made sort of you know it doesn't look very much as it is now but actually absolutely a treasure trove you know when you opened it it really was absolutely wonderful a bar of chocolate condensed milk powdered eggs and then there was spam meat and and there was some um big water biscuits. A little dried fruit sometimes, apricots or something like that. Um, biscuits, you'll get biscuits, but only little small portions of each. There was chocolate in it. But this was chocolate in this tin and it was in six squares. And of course my mother very sensibly uh, didn't let you have one square. It was all sort of cut, but it absolutely melted in your mouth. You could almost taste the butter that was in it. It was absolutely fantastic. Talk about ambrosia. It really was, and you've never forgotten it. It was like manna from heaven. Oh yes, I'll always remember the Red Cross with tremendous gratitude. Yeah. Of course, on the 8th of May, we knew that the war in Europe was over. The news spread like wildfire that Churchill would be um, speaking to the nation at three o'clock that afternoon. Liberation Day for me started the night before. We were, we were convinced that we were going to be liberated the next day. Bert and I joined loads of our friends at the Rockmount Hotel for a dance. And we weren't told there was no curfew that night, but we just came home late. We rode our bikes all the way up Catter Hill along Bailiff's Road, waiting for the Germans to jump out on us and tell us we were out after curfew. And we didn't really care. We were sure that tomorrow would be Liberation Day. The Commandant was here, was never going to surrender. He would see us all skeletons. He would never, ever surrender, and also his um, garrison. Next morning, woke up, we'd heard and shot down to the Cambridge Park and saw this myriad of ships. My mother came to this friend's house to say that the war was over. And we were so excited, Margaret and I, we just, I can remember sort of dancing up and down on the bed and sort of shouting out, wonderful, when are the English coming, you know? My father told the Germans that were living in the house we were going to put the flag up at three o'clock. And they said, no, no, you mustn't, you'll be shot. You must not do that. The war's not over. We've had a meeting at the Regal Cinema and we've been told from news from Adolf Hitler himself that we are fighting to the last blade of grass, so there is no liberation today. And my father said, well, I'm sorry, but there is. And he said, at three o'clock, my flag is going up the flagpole. Everybody gravitated down to the harbour. I think everybody in Greenview was in town when the troops left it. And this great landing craft couldn't get right into the old harbour. She came about a quarter of the way in. And the bows opened from this ship and, and they unrolled this mesh all up to the slipway and then all these lorries came out. And they were standing right on the bows, of the, on the top of the bows, and they were slinging bars of chocolate <laughs> right across quite a distance into the crowd. Captain Franklin, who was a harbour master, he was stood on the pavement opposite the tower, and I was in the middle of the road. And uh, I compared him, his thinness and paleness, with the thickness and the red-faced troops, and I realised at that moment how thin everybody had been on the island. And at three o'clock, every bell on the island began to ring and up went our flag right to the top of the mast.
pyjamas just disappeared back into the house. You never saw another one. They've just gone back into their, their rooms. And the flag was flying there and the bells were ringing and everybody was kissing everybody else. Everybody was laughing. They were crying. Total euphoria. You cannot say anything else. I think we must have sung ourselves hoarse because we hadn't been allowed to sing any of our national songs, certainly not the national anthem. We, I don't think we could even sing Sanya Cherie, but everybody was singing at the top of their voice and hugging and kissing. Now we had a friend who had kept his set, so we went to his house and there was the wireless set in pride of place. And we listened to Churchill's rumbly voice. Say, uh, telling the nation that the war was over. And when he said, and our dear Channel Islands will be free today, there were tears as well as laughter and clapping and cheering. It is my one day uh, of remembrance. Uh, it's something that I can never, ever forget. It didn't really return to normal very quickly. It sort of slid back. We thought everything was going to happen at once, but it didn't. And eventually the Germans just seemed to disappear. They just, just didn't seem to be there anymore. I, I can't remember them ever leaving. There was a terrific um, sense of camaraderie. Everybody tried to help everybody else. And uh, I wish they still happened. They're 60 years gone, and I still flinch when I see food wasted. I said somewhere else, it really was five lost years. Thinking back uh, on the things that we missed out on and what is so plentiful today, I can never, ever forget. I do appreciate living in a free country because nobody can ever appreciate how precious freedom is until they have lost it like we did during the occupation.